This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. For more great podcasts, head over to BigHeadsMedia.com. Tonight on Unsolved Mysteries, the story of Manhattan oncologist turned fugitive. This British-born doctor saved lives up until he ended one. Authorities believe you may be able to help track him down. The female orgasm, for years many have thought it a myth, but this team of scientists and historians' findings may shed a new light on it. Plus, the mysterious assassination of Kiorin, aka Puyo Puyo God 92. Was the Manhattan Triad involved? These intriguing stories all need one final clue. Perhaps someone watching tonight can help. Perhaps it's you. Folks, and welcome to TV Tuners. It's a television podcast for the true fanatics. It's a weekly dive in the latest in TV news and reviews. I'm your host, Swanson. With me, as always, is my other co host and uh, de- desperate mother. Which one? Stairmaster. There's two. Uh, the murdered one. Ah! <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah, uh, it's just me and you here once again. Kieran and the is, bridge uh, that I'm being stored in. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, I guess it still counts as fridging when you don't really do anything to establish the character as anything more than just sort of a collection a plot of... device. Yeah. When the <laughs> character shows up... Story arc or greatness. Yeah, when uh, the character shows up uh, and half the time is nude. <laughs> no, that's cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm down with that. <laughs> yeah. We should have um, got a Nicole Kidman nude scene. It's yeah, like critical two, that only one of them was naked. Yeah, true. The sh- <laughs> much different scene if they were both there in like the, the gym shower. Well, like presumably that. Nicole Kidman would have a towel or something. Pre- yeah, that makes That's sense. That's how gyms work. <laughs> true. Nary a towel to be seen. Um, so and yes. she didn't have a towel either. What the hell? Yeah. She was just walking around nude. Maybe this is like how the upscale gyms of New York work. Oh, wow. The lap of luxury. Wow. Now we finally get to see how the other li- side lives. Yeah. <laughs> I almost said the other lives. Uh, once again, it is just me and you here, Stairmaster. Kieran has, has shirked his duties. Mm. Via dying. Uh, it, Shot right it, underneath the eye. I'm, ass- I'm assuming he's not actually dead. I mean, we've been through this a couple times before. Uh, oh, I mean, in our years doing this pod. Where he did actually claimed- die last time. He just came back, remember? Well, what's to stop him from coming back now? Uh, his corpse looked very gnarly. Well, yeah, lots of corpses look gnarly. The detective on the scene told me it was jaked up. Yeah, that was seemed a little unprofessional, but Denver PD is pretty strange. Yes. They should make a show about them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yes, welcome to TV Tuners. Oh, uh, maybe you can make a TV show about the Denver airport police, and they're all like warlocks who live in the basement. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> It'll be like Queen's Gambit, only the chess they're playing is real humans. (laughs) So it's like Hunters. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Thanks for reminding me of that garbage. Uh, Welcome to TV Tuners. This week it is just me and Stairmaster, but you know, we're we're good pals. Got a fun chemistry. We definitely don't want to kill one another at most moments. Uh, And I definitely don't want to kill myself. At all moments. <laughs> Guess who ran out of antidepressants last week? Yeah, what a terrible time to 
do that at like uh, and uh, any any point in the year probably isn't great, especially for twenty twenty, but uh, specifically right now at this very period. Oh yeah, this is like a NASA team calculated precise moment. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty brutal. Um, welcome to TV Tuners. If you like what you're hearing so far, consider subscribing. Mm-hmm. If that's your jam, we're available on all of the podcast apps of you, podcast apps of your choice. Mm-hmm. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify. We're even on Amazon Music now. Wow, Mr. That's Bezos right. himself will be appearing next week. We're getting the big Bezos bucks. <laughs> J.K. We don't know what he sounds like, so we can't do an impression of him. Sorry. I assume he sounds like this. I assume he sounds like this. Oh. <laughs> Every character on TV Tunes from now on will be Robert Stack. Alright, I'm fine with that. If Jeff Bezos sounded like Robert Stack, I think I would be slightly more okay with him Approving. having uh, ungodly amounts of money. Yeah. I'd be like, he, he might deserve it now. Um, yes, so you can you can give any of those apps a try, give a subscription, uh, or your personal favorite app, whatever app you have right now that you're listening yes. on. You can Tinder, Grinder, That's right. Blur. Swipe right on us. <laughs> uh, and you can also leave a review with five stars. That would be great. That would be like a great little gift. Because, you know, holidays are coming up. Christmas time, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa. We're under the water of five Other houses. holidays that I'm forgetting. Yeah, and you can you can give us the gift under our tree of five stars. I burnt the budget on my bookie.com bets. Yeah, it didn't it didn't go great. You have some real weird choices for host of Jeopardy. Yes. And I also bet on the Washington Generals five times. Yeah, and they won exactly zero times. Yes. Yeah. You also you also bet you also bet on the Washington Nationals who also didn't win. <laughs> yeah, they also were somehow defeated by the Harlem Globetrotters. Uh, yeah, who don't even play <laughs> baseball. It's very strange. <laughs> it's very embarrassing. Uh, but yes, give us a subscribe, give us some five stars, that would be very helpful. And hey, if you want to connect with us on a slightly personal level, why not head over to our Twitter page at TDTuners. Yeah, DM us uh, with your fun. DM us a set of TVs that you've taken a photo of, or just ask us you up. Yeah, and we'll say no. <laughs> That's I'm up. I'm up watching TV. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? Uh, uh yeah, you can. Uh, tons of great TV content over there. Nothing but television, t- constantly being talked about, and. Uh, if if that's not to your liking, of course, you can always email us. Ooh. That's right. Uh, for any of your quips, comments, questions, foresights, or otherwise, you can send yes. them to us at tvtunerspodcast at gmail.com. What's that email, Stair? tvtunerspodcast at gmail.com. That's right. And we'll read those aloud here on the pod. Um, well, Swanson will. I never that's read true. them. Stair will just be... Uh, We'll just go. Oh, oh! I'm like I'm like Waldorf in uh, what's his name? In the balcony. salad, you'll be you're like a Waldorf salad. <laughs> yes, Waldorf salad from the Muppets. That's <laughs> that's right. Is it is Statler? I think is it Statler? Uh, Adam Sandler and Waldorf. That's right. Oh, okay. If they, if, well, that'd, be, if, that'd be a fun guest. Yeah, bring back the Muppet Show and have Adam Sandler on the debut up. Yeah, that would be fun. I would tune in. I would tune in. I'd watch that on an actual television. Yeah. Uh. Um, and with all of that out of the way, how about we get into our tweet of the week, huh, Star? All right. This tweet of the week comes from Isaiah Whitlock Jr., the actor who played Clay Davis on The Wire, who says, "Don't be afraid of COVID." Shit. Uh oh. A surprise, a surprise tweet of the yes. week. I just swapped it out at the last minute without consulting Swanson. <laughs> he's advocating fear, I think. Okay, so he's not saying that you shouldn't be afraid of COVID. No, we should be very afraid, it seems like. Okay, well, that that definitely changes my 
uh, opinion on this tweet thing because that's no, no, too no. Bad. No, because you know Bunk was famously pro Ben Carson, I think, or something crazy like that. What? Why were they talking oh, about wait, Ben what's he, Carson? What's he shit talking? Ben? I know he's like Republican or something. Uh, I'm not gonna look this up. Just just assume blindly that I'm correct. Yeah, why not? I'm sh- <laughs> no one will ever correct you. So I mean, fine. he did star in Jack Ryan, so he's already unforgivable. That's <laughs> that's true. Yeah, uh, you know who didn't star in it? Isaiah Whitlock Jr. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Nicole Kidman. Well, also true as far as I know. <laughs> Might be in season three. Who knows? <laughs> um. Yes. So I'm going to tune in on this. Uh, same. Yeah, it's a good tweet. Wear a mask and also don't go outside. Just wear the mask indoors. Yeah, wear, wh- while you're in your house, wear the mask. So and then feel- don't leave your house. Yes. It's a part of instilling a mindset that you're in an emergency and should be <laughs> at high stress levels at all time. Yeah, that sounds both healthy and uh, friendly to everyone around you. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, that's 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 the tweet of the week. So uh, let's move on to a, a new segment. You know, re- market research shows Stairmaster. Oh, that uh, people love segments. They do. Yeah, they just really love them. And I that's guess that why is we true. Have, yeah, it, it, it gives a sense of organization. Mm, I get the impression uh, that more people listen to our segments than the actual TV recap. That's uh, that's probably. Relatively False. true. Um, <laughs> it's probably yes. Who knows? Uh, the, the 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 metrics aren't in there, but our market research does show people love Ooh. segments. Uh, that's oh, yeah. why I got a new segment here featuring one of our uh, favorite guests. Uh, it's called "Messages from L." Ooh, that's right. My good friend uh, Elgato Bajina. That's right. Uh, L is has sent in this message here about a show she has just watched and uh, we're going to play it here real quick Letters from the Seventh Circle of L Episode 1 Brain Powered The other day I finished watching Brain Powered, the 1998 show directed by Yoshiyuki Tomino and produced by Sunrise As you might expect from Tomino, the show has many of the same motifs as the Gundam franchise, but I was surprised by its originality and consistent quality for a 26-episode broadcast TV show. Those who are casually aware of the show somewhat mistakenly think of it as Gundam creator Tomino's take on Evangelion, as the two share similar themes. However, Tomino maintains that it was conceived mostly prior to Evangelion, and I believe him. Evangelion's Hideki Anno is influenced by Gundam in the first place. While Brain Powered is ambitious, deals with similar metaphysical and philosophical themes, it does so in the Sunrise Tomino way and not so much in the Gainax Anno way. The show takes place on Future Earth, where there are scattered conflicts between organic mecha robots called Brain Powered and Grand Chairs. They are born from rare circular disks called plates, and can be piloted by humans, though they do have thoughts and wills of their own, which as you can imagine, plays a bigger role later in the series. Grand Chairs guard Orphan, a giant organic underwater vessel that is meant to eventually launch into space with a portion of humanity aboard. Conflict arises between Orphan and the UN in the form of giant battleship Novus Noah, when it's predicted that Orphan's launch would drain all energy from living beings on the surface of the Earth, save for simple organisms. What I loved about this central conflict was that it was depicted on two fronts, as the daily life-and-death mech battles between grand chairs and brains, as well as the more realistic bureaucratic slog it would actually be in real life, as the leadership of Orphan attempt to justify its existence in the public sphere, despite the great danger it poses to Earth. It felt eerily prescient considering the ongoing conversations about our potential doom at the hands of climate change, and with ample visuals of already drowned cities in the show. In terms of the technical aspects, I was regularly blown away by how detailed and on-model the character animations and designs were. I don't know how the budget compared to other broadcast shows at the time, but it looks like a complete, intentional work. Lastly, one of the other things that elevated the show to a new level beyond your typical mecha or Gundam entry was the fantastic score by legendary composer Yoko Kano. It borders on world music, encompassing many styles and creates genuine tension and release at all the right points. 
In short, Brain Powered is a very worthwhile watch for any fans of Tomino, Gundam, Evangelion, or Xenogears. It's another wild metaphysical ride with plenty of politics and mech fights. Haha, <laughs> classic L. Delightful commentary from our good pal L. It's I'm what not it's what watch we... that show. Yeah, That's yeah. Um, I don't. I probably won't either. But hey, it's nice to hear some thoughts. Sound that. like absolute hot dog shit. <laughs> A little harsh, but okay. The gayest um, possible thing imaginable. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, with that with that segment out of the way, of course, it's time for yet another one because we just bang them out here on the TV <laughs> Tuners podcast, just left yeah, and right. We like but, to talk and, about TV. Yeah, we 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 love it. And uh, you might be asking yourself, you know, we're about the uh, 12-ish minutes into the pod. Um, and you might be asking yourself, when are they going to get to the TV show factory? And that's well, not going to be for another three hours. That's, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, objectively, we uh, we make the, the potentially poor choice of waiting until the end of the pod to talk about our actual the show we watched. And but, Swanson uh, refuses to change the title of the episodes. That's right, I absolutely refuse. You know what you're getting into at this point, and if you don't, uh, you do now. Uh. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, you've listened to enough of the pod at this point that if you were to turn it off, the algorithm would still count it as a listen. <laughs> nice. Uh, that's how we sink you in. And uh, another way we sink you in is by doing a segment here called The Rabble. Mm. Uh, the rabble okay. here on the, is on the pod is where we get uh, other people's thoughts and opinions on the show that we watched this week. Before Can you we... come, you come on down and get the TV tuners one later. And this is not just a thinly veiled platform for mocking people on the internet. No, that's what Twitter Weeks for. Yes. <laughs> so usually we have three, but due to the unfortunate tragedy, uh, yes, Karen's just nice. We only have. Uh, Two this week? You say well, tragedy, I, have, I say inevitability. Yeah, I have one. I don't know how many Swanson has. Uh, I I went with the critics' reviews, so I figured you got something fun from IMDb. Alright, so I have a 9 out of 10 oh, from user okay. Mabazholm, who I think is actually Donald Trump, judging by the dictation of this review. You'll okay. see. The review is titled, Nicole. <laughs> I'm enjoying this series, but Nicole, her chin has been elongated such that her bottom lip doesn't meet her top lip, and it's driving me crazy. Also, her hair is distracting. So much hair. 9 out of 10. Zero out of 3 found this helpful. <laughs> her. So much hair. What? <laughs> <laughs> so much hair. There, there was hair all over the screen. Nothing but hair. I couldn't even see the people. You hate to see it, folks. I didn't, um, I'll be honest, I didn't notice the hair in this one. <laughs> I mean, we knew she had hair, but it looked normal. Yeah, I wasn't, I guess, yeah, I wasn't like, I wasn't like, oh boy, her hair, her chin. All right, so I looked, through been... this, I, I looked through this person's review, and there's another one titled Kiefer Sutherland. So he just sort of does <laughs> uh, hit pieces on random celebrities. Well, no, this one is just like, hey, this reminds me of 24. This is badass, even though it's Danish. Oh, okay. What was it's the review better, on? better. Thoroughly, oh, Gedelsitgenen. <laughs> okay. I believe this is a miniseries, a two-season series. Gets better and better. Thoroughly enjoyed season one, and season two is even more exciting. The show reminds me of 24 with the Danish version of Kiefer Sutherland in the lead role. Well done. Hmm. I guess the real question about this is that, do you think Donald Trump would watch a Danish show? Hmm. <laughs> I think he could be tricked into it. But I, I think, think that title will turn him off. Yeah, I think if someone told him... Well, no, hold on, wait. Danish are, like, mostly white, right? He probably likes Danish people. Yes. Yeah, he would probably watch... I think uh, Stephen Miller would be like, Mr. President, you need to watch this Mr. President, have you heard about the new good... The no-go zones in Denmark? (laughs) I'm I'm listening. (laughs) 
Yeah. He would he would probably watch it, especially if uh, I'm I'm guessing either Mill and, Miller or Munchen were like, uh, "Hey, uh, what this this is like 24. 24, my favorite show about real events. <laughs> it's what inspired me to become president. <laughs> I had to prevent that nuclear bomb from going off, and folks, I did it. <laughs> so, um, and now we're gonna go to war with the three countries in the Middle East. And there are only three that I know of. <laughs> I'm not going to say their names. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, y- you got the IMDb, IMDb review here. I have the critics' reviews, um, starting with this positive one here from uh, a, 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 a newcomer, as it were. Hold up. they gave This person gave Black Panthers 5 out of 10. <laughs> oh. <laughs> For, or, High expectations, right. they titled it. Okay. Because my expectations were not met, I can only rate it a five. If my expectations were lower, this is about the Oscar nominations, I might have enjoyed it for what it is, a decent superior movie. Nothing more, nothing less. The cultural significance is real, though. Something Donald Trump would never say about a black guy movie. Yeah, no. He would say, like, it was not as not as good as Iron Man. Uh, they gave Bohemian Rhapsody 9 out of 10 stars. Oh. <laughs> I appreciate that they erase gay culture. <laughs> yeah, let's not. Let's stop this sword expose. Sure. Let's uh, focus on what Martin Carr from Flickering Myth had to say Ooh. about uh, the the undoing. This is a positive review. The undoing feels old fashioned in construction, but somehow skirts close to contemporary without seeming to try, offering up solid entertainment from a killer cast. Ah. Uh. I, well, the cast mean, is solid. That's true. That's true. It is a solid cast. I would argue not much that they do. Uh, <laughs> does he mean old fashioned in the sense that it feels like a mid nineties, like low budget thriller? Yeah, it's an eighteen nineties <laughs> stage play. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where people just walking around talking to each other. Um, but like, I don't know. We'll we'll get into this later. But the first episode feels a lot like the boring parts of a mid '90s thriller before the you know like the murders happen. Yes, it's like the opening credits to The Fugitive. Yeah, except you don't even get the glimpses of the murder happening. <laughs> it's just shots of the Chicago skyline. Yeah, uh, this is a negative review by Rachel Cook of the New Statesman. Oh, interesting! Isn't that that newspaper from Watchmen? It sounds like it. I'm going to guess it's not uh, bits of Watchmen lore creeping into our reality. Oh, that'd be unfortunate. Yes. No matter how much you crave kitchen islands, beige cashmere, and Central Park <laughs> in the snow, I'd be willing to bet you won't want to keep watching The Undoing beyond episode two. Ooh, we need to have this lady on. Yeah, this is, sounds cool as shit. <laughs> um, it's way so better that... at their jobs than at our jobs than us. Yeah, I mean, she. That's a pretty withering. That's a pretty uh, withering p- put down. She did what she did in like ten seconds. What we usually have to do an hour and fifteen minutes to do. Yeah, I mean, admittedly, we're not talking about the show for that long usually, unless it's like wild. Unless or Doug. Yeah, <laughs> unless it's a, a a classic from our childhood that doesn't hold up. Yeah, look at our episode on Doug. If you're curious, it's on. We edited it down to ninety minutes. I think. Uh, sure. Let's tell him that. <laughs> uh, so yes, that's uh, that's Rachel Cook's uh, huge burn on this show. Yes, and you could uh, say it was an undoing. Oh, yeah. This show might be undone. Ing. <laughs> should the um, should the theme song for this show have actually been undone? The sweater song by Weezer. <laughs> Let's say, would the intro be the same? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Then yes. <laughs> yeah, I think it would have. I think it would have fit pretty well. Uh, so that's it for the rabble. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> Stay tuned later for uh, our review, our actual TV tuners review on this uh, program. <laughs> And with all that out of the way, let's get to, uh, what'd you watch this week? Anything interesting? Fun? No. Oh, zero things. (laughs)
no. All right. I can't well, remember. I forgot to think about this before I came on. But now that I'm on the spot, I'm too anxious to remember. All right. Well, uh, I'll give a shout out to something I watched this week, which was An Evening with Tim Heidecker. Ooh, interesting. This is uh, a YouTube released stand up special from Tim Heidecker, Ooh. a man not known for stand up. Yeah. Um, it's. It's pretty fantastic. Uh, so the the bit here isn't so much that he's doing like actual like thought up stand up, so much as he's just playing a gag on the audience <laughs> by going up on stage and playing this like obnoxious like uh, male chauvinist character who like oh, gets up there and just starts telling like terrible jokes. So like a spiritual successor to the day the laughter died. Yes. <laughs> Uh, and you can tell, like, the you can tell what you're getting into in the first, like, two minutes, because there's an extended gag of them playing, like, his walk-on music, which is, like, some generic, like, butt rock, <laughs> and he gets up there and, like, fumbles with, he knocks over the mic stand and then fumbles <laughs> with the microphone for, like, a solid minute and a half. Oh, I gotta see this. Um, Preemptive it's, tune in. It's, um, it's amazing. Um, I think one of the standout seg- segments is he brings a couple on stage and then forces them to propose. Oh. <laughs> um, okay. 10 out of 10. Yeah, it's a pretty great. It's pretty great. Um a lot of terrible okay. jokes in there that have no reason to be as fun. They wouldn't be funny if it wasn't <laughs> clear that it was just a gag and anti-comedy. That's five bags of popcorn from Swanson. Yeah, it's it's a uh, truly standout work. Um, you're you're welcome to skip the last like five minutes or so where he's singing his oh his where he's doing his okay music, but that's no. fine. his merely okay music. He has like one good single, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I've only listened to what's played on this special, so oh. I can't say. Um. Well, so yeah, that that's a tune in. Yes. Five bags of popcorn. So do you see anything else? No, that's it. Uh, short seg. That's what I call. Bye that's bye. what I call segments. I call them segs. <laughs> that's how you know I'm hip. And speaking of hip, we got some news for you, folks. Since that's we're right. always with it. Uh, the the meat the news wire is coming in. Beep, 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 beep. Uh, it turns out that uh, comic strips they're apparently in enough to be turned into television shows again. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, particularly one strip that's been around for, I guess, uh, a like century? F- 50 years at this point. Ooh. Um, no, not quite. It, well, close, I guess. It's been ni- it's since 1973. Uh, Hagar the Horrible, everyone's favorite Viking. I have never read Hagar the Horrible. I don't even think it was in syndication for my local newspapers. Oh. Yeah, we got like. What's that? What was that show on Adult Swim that wasn't the Oblongs? The Boondocks. What the, the Boondocks? No, not the. Bo- we got that briefly, but no, is that the, the ba- White Family? Baby Blues. Yes, Baby Blues. We got okay. that instead. Yeah, um, I don't know. We haven't really talked at length about this sort of uh, hidden facet of my being, but I do happen to know way too much about comic strips. Oh. Um. And that includes, of course, <laughs> this... Co- has a collection of them in his basement. Uh, n- not quite. I'm not that, uh, I'm not Ooh. that, that far into it. Uh, I just happen to, I just, it's one of those things that, you know, you just sort of go down a Wikipedia rabbit hole. What? And you start learning way too much about. Wait, you learn, I thought you just collected, like, the anthologies or something. Oh, or no. Read them at I the mean, library, I do... But you went on Wikipedia... <laughs> I do occasionally read them, and they're never okay, you... they're never like it's never good usually. Okay, why why do you know this? How did this happen? And how much know. of this is Hagar specific? Uh, I know a decent bit about Hagar. It's not one of the ones I frequent. Uh, well, usually because it, it tells like the frequent. same five jokes. That's the well, yeah. There are some actual good ones, Stairmaster. Mm. So Hagar, uh, he's uh, he's got a helmet. Yeah, he's a Viking. Does he kill people? Does he fuck? Uh, I guess he bo- canonically does both. He has children, so... Ooh. Um, and yeah, he does definitely kill people. They joke about that frequently. 
So better than Dilbert in every way. That's that's right. Yeah, uh, one of his horns is turned upside down when he's had sex. Oh, <laughs> isn't it turned upside down all the time though? <gasps> uh, I yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so Hagar has a, an extended bench here, and they're turning oh. this into a animated series uh, that I guess is going to focus on his family and friends. I mean, a cartoon Viking that seems like a decent sell. I guess true. Uh, it's taken uh, like fifty, almost fifty years for it to happen. So good on Hagar. Oh, they needed a backlog so they didn't catch up with the present day strips. <laughs> you know, they wanted to avoid Dragon Ball Z or like a Full Metal Alchemist situation. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, and Otherwise, I guess you'll have Hagar and his nemesis is standing by a lake for an entire episode, flashing back to previous scenes in the fight. What I can say positively about Hagar is that it is, I guess, uh, unique in the landscape of comic strips because it's not like a boring, like, hand, yeah, like three suburban. panel strip about suburban, suburbia. Mid century America. Yeah. And it is, in fact, just a Viking doing Viking stuff, but Who also occasionally having to deal with his family. Presumably he doesn't have depression. Uh, from the looks, I mean, he drinks a lot, but that's uh, that seems to just be because he likes it. It's a medieval age, Swanson. Yeah, that was sort of your television. Yeah, nothing. Was a, yes, was a drink. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, he uh, he's got a wife, of course, Helga. Oh. Who uh, who is the classic sort of uh, blonde she's and hot. like? Uh, she looks like a wife character. So oh. I don't know, not really. <laughs> Um, he has a son named Hamlet. What? Oh, that's is, never a good sign. <laughs> yeah. Also, I think it's an, uh, I don't think that fits for the timeline. Maybe they're going to invade England very soon. Maybe Ooh. it happens right after the event of the comic strip. Yeah, that's, that's probably true. Uh, he has a daughter, a 16 year old daughter named, uh, Hani. Uh, uh, that's and a, that's not a good name. Uh, no. Try again. <laughs> Uh, she's, she has, she's, uh, tends to be overdramatic is what the characterization says. I've, uh, I've, I'll be honest. I've seen her in maybe two strips. Total. Ooh. So it's like a cat bird situation. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and I've seen her, uh, boyfriend character in one and his name what? is Loot, who is an inept bard or troublemaker or, oh, mit, or troubadour. Sorry. Not troublemaker. <laughs> That's strange um, being named after an instrument, and that also being your job. Yeah. He also has a dog whose name is Snurt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I like that. How big is the dog? Uh, it's a tiny dog, but it, wear, it does wear a Viking helmet. All right. <laughs> I was hoping it'd be a giant dog. That would be nice, right? Yeah, that'd be fun. Um, and uh, apparently in news that I was not aware of, there's a do- there's a, a family duck. What? Oh, well, yeah, it's a medieval age. They had to have livestock. I guess it's true. Uh, and his name is Kavak. Why does... So, wait. <laughs> it's a, it's an anthropomorphic duck like the dog. It has a personality and stuff. Uh, I'm Presumably. assuming, according to Wikipedia, it has named it's named uh, Kavak because uh, the, the that's how you say quack with a German accent, what? I guess, allegedly. Oh, man. How is he supposed to talk to other ducks then if his name is K- Quack? Yeah, very, very. That's didn't very think tragic. That one through. Yeah. So anyway, uh, this is going to be an animated sitcom featuring the the Hagar clan, mm-hmm. or the horrible clan. I don't know what his last name is. Um, I know the horrible is probably a title. Yeah, probably because he's like he tells horrible jokes. <laughs> does he? Um, is that a thing okay. He does? Uh, uh, let me look at the. I found a comic strip from the other day. Oh, Hagar. okay. Uh, so I brought research material for the pod. You can look at this and describe it to the pod to the the pod community if you want. Okay, from comicskingdom.com. All right, the king. There's a king in the throne. Sort of looks like the guy from the Zelda CDI games. He says, "I expect you to surrender immediately." To his right is Hagar, who says, "What?" Surrounded by a band of men. The king asks, do you need a translator? And then Hagar responds, no, I understand crazy talk. 
I should mention the men all have weapons and are surrounding the king. Yeah, it sounds like the king is making like a defiant last stand here. <laughs> so presumably the fourth panel, if there were one, would just be Hagar beheading him. <laughs> That's kind of badass when you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> There's some hidden deaths here, I think. That should be explored in the cartoon series. Yeah, you think like, he should just be murdering people left and right? Yes. That should at the very least, you know... We should see the aftermath. Like, That's maybe true. he should have a skull collection in his house or something. Uh, uh, I think the major thing here from this news item is that uh, the Jim Henson Company are the ones developing what? this animated Hagar the, the Horrible show. How are they supposed to do animation if they do puppets? Apparently, this is a this is the work of Henson's Digital Puppetry Studio, which allows the puppeteers to control digital characters in real time. So it's computer animation. Uh, but, probably, which sounds like it's going to look horrible. So it's but. not puppetry at all. Fuck you. It's puppetry of the virtual space. I'm disappointed in you, Mr. Henson. Do better next time. Wow. All right. Uh, there's no telling yet where Hagar the Horrible's show is going to land, but uh, I don't know. Probably like a Netflix type of deal, maybe. I think Jim Henson has a deal with them. Yeah, that was the last Henson program. Yeah. I'm guessing uh, it could be either... Netflix or HBO Max. Uh, fun fact, the uh, co-creator of Hagar uh, worked on Beetle Bailey, which is a show about, which is not a show, it's a comic strip about uh, people who are perpetually stuck in the military. Ooh. Uh, the titular Beetle Bailey is like a lazy military yes. guy. Yeah. Yes. He's like a Doogie Hazard, but with a gun. <laughs> sure, Has he yeah. ever been shown with a gun? I don't think anyone in Beetle Bailey carries weapons. Is Beetle which Bailey is probably go to for Vietnam? the best. Or Korea? Um, it was launched in 1950, so he probably went to both. Wow. <laughs> what a true pay- war criminal. Yeah. It is wild to me how many of these comic strips just last beyond the sell by date. All you gotta do is draw three drawings. A, yeah, a day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and like try and figure out a joke for them. Yeah, this one, the one you showed me doesn't even have a background. There's like a curtain behind the king's <laughs> throne, and that's it. It's true, yeah. Uh, what you really need to do is become like the Heathcliff guy, <laughs> where you draw just one weird abstract thing, put a caption on it, and call it a day. Oh, yeah, so mystifying. Yeah. The people I think... don't want it to go out of publication until they figure it out. Um, as someone who does sort of look, not daily, but at least weekly, at the uh, Heathcliff strips, uh-huh. I will say that it is sort of, there is like a cathartic element to them. Once you get into like the rhythms what? of them, the ma- there's like a weird like comedy to them. Uh, Swanson, sense. we call that schizophrenia. Well, the creator might be, who knows. Um, I'm not going to like, I'm not going to say Heathcliff is good. Yeah. No. I just want to a... say I'm happy to, that I'm learning a lot today. Like the fact that you're 80 years old, apparently. Yeah. I have the spirit of a man who would vote for Donald Trump. <laughs> you have the spirit of a man who would vote for Gerald Ford and did. <laughs> Twice. Yeah. I have, a spirit, I have the spirit of a man who was alive when FDR was running the country. Yeah. <laughs> That's a tune in on Hagar, I guess. Uh, sure. No? This can't come back to bite us in the ass. Yeah, Hagar's gonna do something like racist next week. <laughs> uh, speaking of uh, Netflix, pro- potential Netflix programming, uh, it turns out that uh, they're getting a big coup. Uh, because someone, uh, a, a famous action star and former governor has returned to the Jesse world. Jesse Ventura? Of- That's right. That's right, McMahon. <laughs> I'm on streaming now. Two. It's the only. That's right. It's the only thing that'll let me hawk my dangerous conspiracy theories. <laughs> Are his theories really that dangerous compared to what's going around nowadays? No, but <laughs> I feel like he was like a precursor, right? Because uh, he was doing it way before it became like before like Alex Jones was popular. I know him for saying stuff like the Osama raid guys weren't heroes for killing him. And that you can't be a hero just for killing people and stuff like that. 
Yeah, I mean, like he, you know, he's he's right more than most conspiracy nuts. The, like in yes. terms of like he says things that make sense and are true. Um, but no, it's not Jesse Ventura. I'm talking about, of course, his uh, co-star, Arnold. <laughs> yes, his co-star, Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's me, co-star of Predator. <laughs> I wish I had gotten much much screen time. If only Jesse. I had gotten as much screen time as the Predator, I could have gotten my SAG card <laughs> much sooner. What? Hmm. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Who is your daddy and what does he do? <laughs> uh, and soon he'll be asking that on streaming television. What? Uh, the former governor is apparently working on a uh, currently untitled spy show oh. that is uh, set to land on Netflix. True lies, remembrance. It does reminiscence. <laughs> I'll be honest; it does kind of sound like true lies. So this um, is like a fictional thing. It's not a reality show where he spies on people. No, this is this is the this is a, a fictional thing. This isn't like Arnold Schwarzenegger doing like ah. Oh, I love re- peeping. Wasn't there? What was that reality show where Steven Steven Seagal was? Uh, uh, sheriff, big time sheriff. Yeah, like it's not that, but with Arnold Schwarzenegger doing spy missions. <laughs> I'm no. being sent into Afghanistan to protect this opium field. <laughs> no, it is not. I am not Arnold Schwarzenegger. I am Jim. Mister, I am Mister Big. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jim Plenty. My name is Mister Black. Uh, what it'll be, what the show is set to be focused on is uh, Schwarzenegger and a, a uh, an actress as a father daughter team. Lee Curtis. Oh no, a father daughter team who end up getting into some sort of spy shenanigans. Yeah, it sounds like a sequel to True Lies. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's being run by the future showrunner for the uh, Amazon Jack Reacher show. So. Uh, uh, uh. Is he even involved in any of the movies? The no. Jack Reacher films? No. Would a Jack, Would Arnold have made a good Jack Reacher if they had made it in, like, the 90s? <laughs> well, the thing about Jack Reacher is it's a British guy taking the shit out of shitty American airport novels. But it's so ridiculous that you kind of take it seriously yourself. Yeah. So I guess Arnold might be a good one. I mean, because, like, he has more... Kinda- he- he has more ability to take the shit out of things, th- or take the piss out of things, than yeah. Sylvester Arnie's Stallone. Good at comedy. Yeah, like S- 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 Sly Stallone Stone is isn't. Serious. Yeah, he's not funny at all. Usually, but it was pretty funny casting Tom Cruise like the smallest possible action star to be Jack Reacher and filming him up and in- and up shots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I didn't watch the Jack Reacher movie so much as see clips of it, but, like, wasn't it also not comedic in any way? <laughs> like... <laughs> it was very dry. Yeah, like, shouldn't the Jack <laughs> Reacher... If if what you say is true, I haven't... I don't know enough about Jack Reacher. Shouldn't it be more of, like, a last action hero type of deal? No, it's it's very... It's kind of played straight. But the, what's straight is very ridiculous in itself. Like, there's yeah. a book... Where the clim- we're near the climax, he fights this giant man, this like seven, eight foot tall man, who has a giant house where everything is proportionally larger to accommodate him. <laughs> <laughs> What's this Jack in the Beanstalk level <laughs> set piece? Yeah, the books are good. You should read them. Uh, as for <laughs> as for Arnold, apparently the show has a script to series commitment, which in the TV lingo means that. Uh, It'll have to be put into production. It can't be, like, <sighs> cut off. Oh, start like shooting that. now! You will pi- you will film my movie now! Stream um, while the pandemic's going on! Everyone's streaming! <laughs> I don't know how much Arnold's going to be doing action-wise in this. He did. Oh, I think he no. did just have, like, heart surgery or something. Again? <laughs> yeah, I think oh, so. Oh, God. I don't think he's long for this earth. Um... If he dies, we have to take TV tuners off for the week. In mourning? Yes! Yeah. Uh, we'll have to launch, like, a, a secondary podcast where we go through his filmography. <laughs> you know what? I would love that. 
I told you I'd save this film for last. I lied. <laughs> Um, yeah, so who knows what this is going to entail, but I imagine it's going to be a lot of the daughter doing a lot the heavy lifting. Oh my god, can you imagine if Barney actually recorded a message like that for when he does die, and they put that in whatever film it is after the dedication? Remember when I said I'd die? I didn't lie. <laughs> I won't be back. <laughs> oh, oh, he did say that in, he did say that in the last term, hater. <laughs> Wait, what? He did? Yeah, yeah. Terminator <laughs> said that to his su- adopted son before going off to fight the bad Terminator. That's that's, stu- right, that's so dumb. Wife. His human that... wife. Uh, all right, sure. Why not? Honestly, it was the only redeeming part of that last sixty-six percent of the movie. <laughs> that's Arnie. Well, yeah, I mean that makes sense. He has uh, he has the charisma to carry a movie even in his advanced age. Mm. Well, um, speaking of uh, people who have tragically passed, uh, as we mentioned briefly on the pod last week, Alex Trebek, a longtime host of Jeopardy, mm. and um, all guy around... who appeared on Adam Sandler film once. Yeah, uh, and Cheers. He appeared on Cheers once, and he appeared on The Simpsons. It's true. He's appeared, he, what we learn is that uh, he's appeared in a lot of things. Yes. Uh, most notably, Jeopardy, which he hosted for like uh, most famously since inception. Yeah. Um. He uh. He 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 hung it up, as in life. Um. And now people are, of course, moving on to speculate who can be the next host of Jeopardy. Mm. Um. So much so that people are placing bets on it. Ooh, on mybookie.com. Uh, yeah, but we don't have to talk about specifically where they could place bets because we're not oh, getting paid. We're not that. being paid. Yeah. <laughs> Did we get paid? Yeah, of course. Oh, I didn't see any money. Check your bank account. Mm. So, uh, yeah, you can bet on anything, of course. The Puppy Bowl, National Elections, the end of Game of Thrones. Mm, the ongoing insurgency in Colombia. I'm sure you Forker, could bet on that. Forker the government. Who will come out on top? Who? Spoilers, it's going to be the government. Yeah, it's always the government, usually. Um, so, yeah, there's uh, there's some odd there's some odd bets being made in the running Ooh. for Jeopardy. So, uh, I have here a Do list of some of... you want to say who you think the successor is going to be first? Oh, sure. Uh, I have two answers, but I'll have you go first. Uh, Frazier. The character? <laughs> <laughs> the guy. Oh, it's Kelsey Grammer. Kelsey Grammer. Don't do drugs, uh, kids. Hmm. I feel like it... I don't know if I'd want to watch a Jeopardy with Kelsey Grammer. I feel like you would have the right sort of, you know, interrogating the contestants' energy. And, the, uh, you know, the gravitas. If he does mm. a Frasier accent. That's true. Uh, the the popular pick and the person who's currently at fractional odds one to one in betting is uh, Ken Jennings, former uh, big time winner of Jeopardy, <laughs> and oh, also guy. sort of an amiable, uh, level headed guy who's also been hosting some other game shows that are Jeopardy esque. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, that'd yeah, be poetic. Weirdly enough, uh, runner-up in the betting odds, seven to two, is George Stephanopoulos. What from I don't MSNBC? Wanna see, yeah, I don't want to see that. No, but I would see it more than I would see uh, number three here, fourteen to one odds, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Oh God, I don't want to see that dude ruining movies on Twitter. I don't want to see that dude here. You might as well just have a cardboard cutout giving the contestant a middle finger. He would, like, yeah, he would point out how wrong everyone's answers are. <laughs> uh, Pat Sajak is here, and I'm assuming that's only because he hosts Wheel of Fortune, and that's the uh. lead into Silver Jeopardy, usually. <laughs> What's gonna happen to Wheel of Fortune? I don't know, uh, I think it should be Danny DeVito. Oh, that would be fun. I mean, I don't yeah. know how long he'd be able to host, he is also old. Uh, it's not like you have to do much, just have, like, a robot hold him up so he doesn't have to stand on his own. I mean, I, I think he's capable of holding up. It's just that he's also old. Um, I saw, so my actual pick, and someone who has 20 to 1 odds actually right now, um, 
the same 20 to 1 odds as other people who won't take the job, like Katie Donald Couric Trump. and Jimmy Kimmel, um, is LeVar Burton. <laughs> no, come on. He's got um, better things to do. I feel like he he won't. I feel like he won't be the pick. I'm pretty sure. Sh- I'm. I would eat my. I'm not going to eat my shoe because I, I don't want to make a bet. Uh, I'll eat my shoe of like Donald Trump, who has like no, I think Donald currently Trump... one to one thousand odds. Yeah, no, Donald Trump is going to be the next host of the Tonight Show, and it's going to be amazing. <laughs> you tossed my hair, and now I've tossed you out of a job. Yeah. <laughs> he tossles Jimmy Fallon's hair. That's, sort of, he... that's what you want from an interviewer. Is that sort of drip? Yeah. Oh, and then he could talk about how he's having ratings battles with Colbert. No, he would demolish Colbert because you'd have you'd have the MAGA guys, but you'd also have the libs hate watching him. Well, that's what I mean. He would talk about records. how he would talk about how he's I'm beating liberal Stephen Colbert at the ratings. Little Frenchie can't keep it up. <laughs> Nobody's watching his program anymore. Bye bye. Um, LeVar Burton would, I could see him hosting Jeopardy. He would probably be good at it, but it's like, hey, let no. him do some other stuff. At least give him a talk show. Yeah. If, he, if that's what Have him take is. over the Tonight Show. Yeah. It would do terrible ratings, but let him do it. Have a murder Eric Andre and take his place for an episode. That'd be yeah. fun. Um, other Which people on the LeVar list. Burton. Wish I was LeVar Burton. <laughs> I can't say the rest. Uh, right. Other people on the list, Neil Patrick Harris, Trevor Noah, why? <laughs> this A lot of this list runs as just people... That's the only way people... to save the Daily Show, to get no, him off. True, yeah. A lot of this list uh, is going to be people you're going to find are people who have shown up on TV before. Ooh, interesting. Uh, Drew Carey, already hosting a game show. Uh, Howie Mandel. <laughs> Steve Willie Hart. Nelson. Steve Harvey. Oh, that would be good. That'd be fun, but again, I'm already hosting a game talents. show. Um, John Stewart. No, no, he wouldn't. God. I wouldn't want to see that at all. I, he needs to stay in the woods or wherever he's living now. Um, and at sixty-six to one odds, Joe Rogan. <laughs> yes, I would. Yeah. I would watch Jeopardy if that happened. I love the idea of (laughs) just like Joe Rogan being on his podcast and being like, check me out on Jeopardy (laughs) every weekday. Uh, It would be interesting because Joe Rogan would probably accept a wrong answer if the if the contestant was empathetic enough. (laughs) And that's how Donald Trump won Jeopardy. (laughs) Yeah, like like he would be like, huh, I've never (laughs) He'd be like, oh, I'm telling well, you, the capital of New York is New York. That's why it's the biggest city. That's why I put my tower there. That's quite the rhetorical argument. I guess you've won Jeopardy. <laughs> Alternatively, they just hold up their phone and show him videos of gorillas fighting to make him break yeah. his train of thought. <laughs> Whoa, look at this. This is jujitsu. Um, so yeah, those are some of the odds. The wilder odds are like Donald Trump and people like that who have like one in one thousand odds. Um, but yeah, well, it remains to be seen. Uh, apparently Trebek has like banked episodes up till the end of the year. Oh. So we're not going to find out for a while probably who the host is. And even if we are, does it really like, is it really going to matter much? Yes, it's Jeopardy. Yeah, but like people were up in arms when... All those years ago when Drew Carey took over The Price is Right, and now he's just an accepted facet of your day-to-day life when you're watching TV at 11 a.m. Oh, I think everyone who had problems with that died of old age. Yeah, and so will the people who had problems with Jeopardy. Like, Jeopardy's a, like a, a good show. Like, that's def- like a definition of a good game show, right? I... Yes. Like, I mean, like... It's weird because it's always weird that its lead in is Wheel of Fortune, a show that is pretty much as dumb as it can, as you can get. Yeah, that's stupid. My mom watches that and I don't understand it. Like Wheel of Fortune in comparison to Jeopardy is like is like apples and like refuse that you found in the sewer. Like Jeopardy and Price is Right is like the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo. All Price is Right or Wheel of Fortune is like the ColecoVision. <laughs> yes.
So yeah, we'll, we'll 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 all have to see later in life how this goes. And by later in life, I mean probably next year. We're really covering like niche bases this week on the pod. <laughs> comic game strips shows, and comic- game shows. <laughs> niche bases for people who are who have AARP cards and won't listen to this podcast. Yeah, because they don't know what it is. I don't even think I could get my dad to listen to this. Yeah, and you know what? Good move on his part. Oh, he would probably tune out with from all the Trump impressions. Well, yeah, he wouldn't like that, huh? Yeah. All right. Well, uh, that's about it for the news. So uh, let's move on to a segment that's near and dear to our hearts. It's Trailer Blazers. Hit the theme, Stair. Uh, it's raining outside. It's raining outside. It's raining outside. Gonna get high. Gonna get high. Gonna get high. Gonna get high. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, welcome to Trailer Blazers, where we talk about the latest and greatest in trailers. Uh, this week we're doing something, uh, a trailer for something that isn't Ooh. technically a show, I guess, so much as uh, a... It's a program. I guess it is a program, and it is sort of about a show. Yeah, uh, sort of, or just is about a show? Uh, it I, seems, yeah, it's talking about a show. I would argue this is definitively about a show. Yeah. About a I story would... about how someone's life got flipped, turned upside down. That's right. We're, uh, we watched the trailer for the reunion of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Oh, I should have done that instead of, for the theme. I could have done the whole thing. <laughs> <And I> would... <laughs> I feel like anyone born of a certain age can do this, the whole theme, right? You want to do a duet? No, um, no, no, okay. fuck no, 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 no. All right. Well, you know, I was born in West Philadelphia. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the the titular uh, series that catapulted Will Smith into stardom and was also a way for him to avoid going to jail for tax fraud. <laughs> uh, tax evasion, not tax fraud. If only Wesley Snipes had started in a TV show. Yeah. Rest in peace. Yeah. Um, the... This trailer is uh, a uh, lot of like sitting around the set, being like, "Remember like, this." It feels like you kind of already see the entire program. Yes, I don't have to watch it. Uh, I will say the most interesting part for me is um, instead of in normal trailers where they do the little like five seconds of like big shots to keep keep you interested before you like scroll past it. Yes. Uh, they have five. They have five seconds of Will Smith being like, "Hey, l- listen." <laughs> Uh, listen, it's me. I'm charming. Watch this trailer. Yeah, and... It doesn't work. He's lost it. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like he's pretty charming in this. Um, uh, it's it's a big nothing here because it's like uh, it feels like it's given away most of what you can expect from this trailer, uh, from this special. Like, yeah, I expected them to be sitting in the set, a recreation of the set, presumably. Um. And they're hanging out there, and, you know, the whole cast is there. Very light on Jeffrey, I noticed. Oh, yeah, they don't understand what made the show work. I don't even see a shot of Jeffrey in this in these, in this trailer. I feel like there are two. Yeah, like, I, like, give me some of him. Come on. We, we knew that he he's, like, essential to the show. I think the people making this trailer never saw the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Yeah. It's and this work osmosis. That's why we get all the classic bits like Carlton <laughs> knowing that they couldn't afford bigger clothes, so he didn't choose. He chose not to grow bigger. Yeah, that's a good. And point. why doesn't he like me, man? All parts that are like iconic. And stuff. Yeah, they do a little bit here where they uh, they talk about uh, James Avery, of course, Uncle Phil, everyone's Uncle Phil. Mm-hmm. Everyone's. Uh, yeah, you know, and that part's like a little affecting, but at the same time, it's like. Uh, yeah, does this need to be in a trailer though? Yeah, like we know you're going to talk about it. Do you need to yeah, put it, it in like the trailer? It feels like you're commoditizing his death. <laughs> yeah, like we like we know it's going to be brought up because you can't do the reunion without bringing it up. Uh-huh. But uh, I don't know. It's uh, it's interesting. Um, I love. I think my favorite part about this is the end where Will Smith is like, "Hey, listen, you know, I couldn't do this without the the first Aunt Viv." And then, like, they show, like, Aunt Viv yes. going into, like, the set by herself. Like, they're, like, they, like, they're framing it like she's going to ruin the reunion. 
All right, you gotta see how people react. Is there gonna be drama? Are they gonna make out? What's gonna happen? What if her? Yeah, what if her and Will Smith just made out? <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> I feel like they would not. I feel like the other cast would not be fan to that and would disapprove. What if while they were voicing their disapprovement, Will Smith was loudly yelling in between like passionate kisses? <laughs> this is for Uncle <laughs> Phil. This is for Uncle <laughs> Phil. <laughs> Uh, I don't think that would help its case. <laughs> would I feel you? like he would... <laughs> that would be like a Mel Gibson tier kind of Fox Pass celebrity fa- <laughs> faux pas. Yeah, like a like a, a like a Tom Cruise jumping on a couch level breakdown. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But the Tom Cruise couch one was just fun. Nobody turned on him for that. Well, yeah, true. Yeah, uh, I feel like it would be a. I, it would make me want to watch the special, for sure. If that happened, um, as is, this is like lighthearted and fun. So like, maybe I would watch it if it was on something that wasn't HBO Max. Like, I'm not paying fifteen dollars to see this. Yeah, it feels like yeah. I don't know how they're expecting to get new buys from this. It seems like an added value to your already pre-existing purchase. Yeah, like the. Um, and I think I feel like reunion specials have gone the way of like the um, like variety show, in terms of yeah. like they don't they don't have any commodity anymore because you can just go watch the thing. Yes, um, I feel like and- we need to escalate them like Iran Contra the reunion special or something, <laughs> not, the, not 90 sitcoms. Yeah, like Ali North <laughs> and some Iranian special forces guy. Yeah, so um, I'm. Uh, I guess I'll tune out on this. There's nothing here for me. Oh, I was never gonna tune in on this. Why did did you think I was? No, I mean, look, tune yeah. in on Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Yeah, now, tune out on the re- on a reunion of it. Fresh Prince of Bel Air now available on UPN at like eleven a.m. eleven p.m. at night. UPN? <laughs> Where you? What time t- tunnel did you go through? Ah, uh, I saw it on UPN at two thousand. In 2006 at 11 a.m. once. Oh, okay. I, I can remember saying... that, but not what I watched this week. What is wrong yeah. with my brain? <laughs> uh, UPN, a classic misunderstood station that had terrible programming. And by misunderstood, and by terrible programming, of course, you mean Dilbert. Yeah, well, it was weird that they put Dilbert on UPN. <laughs> yeah. It's also weird how Dilbert had, like, a meta plot for the first season running across all the episodes. It did? Yeah. Like, there was this one big project they were working on, and, like, all the episodes kind of tied into that. Yeah. What a wild time. Do you think there's an alternate reality where Dilbert was more successful than, like, I don't know, Futurama? I hope not. (laughs) Sounds like a bad timeline. I feel like you just have a have a completely different production team working on it for that to happen. I don't think that anyone involved in Dilbert had it in them to make that quality of a product. That's true. Also, you definitely need a network that like supports wants, it. Yeah, wants it. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. Well, that's uh, that's it. That's a tune out on that. Uh, better luck like next time, Will. I guess you'd have to put Dilbert on WB or something. I don't think it's a Fox show. Uh, I can see Dilbert on Fox. I can see no. it on CBS. Yeah, Dilbert is not on CBS. It's, but it's, it's like office work. That's perfect for old people. No, they. I don't think... I, don't, I can't There's remember... old people working in offices. My dad's an old guy who works an office job. I don't think well, CBS has ever aired an animated show. Well, he works from home, but he has a Dilbert-ass job. Um, Maybe the Flintstones was on CBS. I don't know. Yeah, probably... Um, but no, no, I don't think that would be a thing going on there. Uh, well, if you have thoughts on what network Dilbert could air on, you can email us at tvtuningspodcast at gmail.com. That's right. And before someone corrects me, uh, the Flintstones was, of course, on ABC. Oh, I guess Dilbert could work on ABC. Uh, we don't think about ABC that much. Uh, yeah, so that's it for Trailer Blazers, uh, which means that there's nothing left in the pod but for us to go to our main event this evening. We watched uh, the show, and now we're going to talk about it. Uh, we the un- NPR Undoing. Oh, 
or will it be our uh, uh, re- redoing? Redoing? Uh, yeah. I think it would just be doing. Is that the sequel series? The redoing where they have to travel back in time and save that lady so yeah. her and Nicole Kidman can get gay married? Yes. <laughs> That's right. And Donald Sutherland's still there for two seconds. I built you a time machine. <laughs> uh, the Undoing <laughs> focuses on Nicole Kidman's Grace Frazier, a successful therapist, and her devoted husband Jonathan, played by Hugh Grant, and as their uh, and their young son as he attends a private elite private school before mm-hmm. Hugh Grant is uh, embroiled in a uh, becomes a suspect in a murder case of a, a fellow patron of the school. Um. The okay. Undoing is available on HBO. Uh, it's, it's it's a show. It's a program. It's an hour long. Yeah. Uh, c- can I say how ballsy it is that they made their protagonist a therapist and then named her Frasier? Yeah, wild, I think right? You could pick any last name, guys, in the universe. Yeah. And you picked Frasier. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's wild. Um... <laughs> So does the does the undoing leave you undone, or is it making you done? Is it? Yeah, are you finished? You fi- uh, you're getting finished watching this? Did you get finished? <laughs> I don't fucking know. Let's just recap it and move on. All right. Uh, and by stuff. move on, you mean end of the podcast? <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, a program from David E. Kelly. Who um, has done some? He, he's a pretty notable TV writer or producer, creator. Yes. What titles uh, has he done? Ally McBeal, oh. uh, The Practice, Chicago Hope, uh, Dookie Hauser was his first program. Ooh, the uh, the Beetle Bailey of doctors. <laughs> that's right. Uh, he's he most notably in recent years did Big Little Lies for HBO, which is also which is pretty similar to this actually. Oh. Um, although it has like a much better cast in terms of giving them stuff to do. Nicole oh, okay. Kidman was also a lead in that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> we live in a strange universe indeed. Uh, he also did Boston Legal, which you might remember from the mid-aughts ABC days where uh, William Shatner was on that program. Oh, I thought that was the one where they said shit and that caused uh, a controversy. It was, I think. Oh, okay. Then yes, I know it. Um, yeah, Kelly was like, I think Kelly's a former lawyer uh, before he started writing for TV. Um, but anyway, yeah, you don't get any of that from anything here, really. Um, it's not, it's weird to describe this show. Uh, I think the thing I can say up front is that I am really already, like, tired of this just, should have been. <laughs> yes. I'm just tired of like dramas about white people, about well off white people uh, who will have to face some sort of personal tragedy. I just I I don't. Got, I don't care. You can't I expect me in the, in 2020 to care about what happens to <laughs> these rich people. I got bad news for you, Swanson. There's an old adage in writing, and that's write what you know. Yeah, and guess and what all these Hollywood screenwriters are? <laughs> well, not all, not everyone who works in Hollywood is rich, but uh, but like eighty percent of them working, are rich fail sons. Yeah, like a guy like David E. Kelly, who's been working and write and writing since the early nineties, is definitely mm-hmm. rich. Yes, um, I mean the dude's married to Michelle Pfeiffer. I mean, famously, like James Cameron was a truck driver before he got into the film industry. I don't think that happens nowadays. I think it's all like generational inheritance and whatnot yeah it's people who like yeah who grew up in california and then like took some ucb classes yes now they're writing um like yeah. max brooks uh for yeah, example <laughs> exactly or um, or jj abrams was the, like some guy's son yeah J- even joss whedon was someone's son yes <laughs> Like a, a famous like like what writer of western shows was uh, his dad. <laughs> um, and who's the who's the guy that really sucks? Uh, what Max uh, Landis? David Bennett. 
That's oh, Max Land is definitely big neo-teptism there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, back to the show, I guess. The, yeah, I'm so just... Nicole Kidman's brushing her teeth, and I noticed that there's only one sound effect for teeth brushing in all of Hollywood media. Oh, yeah? Yeah. It's the same one? <laughs> yes, I've never heard any other one. Oh, interesting. And um, now you have to pay attention every time someone's brushing their teeth to see if I'm right. Dang. Sort of got everyone in on it now. Also, Put that's him... not the cold open. The cold open is something else. The cold open is like a murder that we don't get to see yet. Yeah. Yeah. We just see this um, kid walking in on it. Yeah. And being like, <gasps> oh no. Uh, also, the intro with this, like, child. Who doesn't show up in the actual program, which no. I thought was. Uh, the intro also has a, p- a mournful piano cover of Dream a Little Dream. Another thing I'm sick of, mournful piano covers. Um, so yeah, a lot of this show, at least in the early going, uh, this show really tips its hat with a lot of things, huh? Uh, the screenplay's not a strong suit. Yeah, uh, they have the, they have two separate scenes in the show where Nicole Kidman is... Uh, doing her therapist thing with people, and it's like oh, yeah, so weird. obviously set up that it, these are th- that we're exploring the themes through these characters that she's talking to. Yeah, it's, the first one's weird because we it's just a very strange cutoff as well. Yeah, where she tells this lady some very upsetting stuff, but we don't actually get to see her yell at her. Yeah. Um, and it's weird because she's like, uh, listen, I, you know, people hire listen, me you to... Need to, yeah. So the first one, she's like, listen, you need to judge your man properly since you judge everything else in your life. OCD ishly. Yes. And then the second one, she's like talking to this couple that's had infidelity and getting into why that happened. Yeah. I wonder if that's going to mean anything for this program. Huh. Interesting. I, I doubt it will be relevant. There's probably just a scene there for dressing. Um, so I think the the main thing here that uh, I got from this is that uh, Nicole Kidman's character doesn't like feel like anything. <laughs> she doesn't feel... Like she doesn't. Jeez. I can't tell what like I'm supposed to be getting from her character. Well, she's not doing anything this first episode. So is that what they meant by doing... undoing? <laughs> Yes, that's the opposite of doing. <laughs> so because none of the characters are actually doing anything, uh, presumably. Uh, maybe yes, one of them this, murdered, but we don't know. This episode is mostly just like table setting. Yeah. For something that could potentially be entertaining. Um, a lot of the early going is Hugh Grant doing like his Hugh Grant thing. Oh he's yeah, like, he's got, I kind of got to give props to him. He's got major I want to kill myself energy in this. It's a good performance. <laughs> Yeah, he uh, he does a, a lot of the heavy lifting towards making these uh, characters seem less loathsome. Mm-hmm. Um, because he's like, he understands that he is a rich person who also uh, hates his life. <laughs> yes. So that makes me like, oh yeah, okay. I'm okay with this. Like, I, I don't mind. I, 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 it's fine. As long as you're suffering. Like yeah. the rest of us. Um, so yeah, he, uh, he's doing a lot of his, like, charming Hugh Grant shtick, which is clearly being, yeah, uh, he, it's clearly being set up to be, like, a thing where the, he does all of that so that you are shocked when you learn that he might be a murderer. When he undoes that person. <laughs> yes, when he undoes a life. <laughs> um, there's not a whole lot to this episode though like i feel like in terms if we wanted to just get beat by beat we could go through the entire plot in like 10 minutes um yeah it's not a great use of your screen time no uh it feels like the boring like i said i think i said it earlier on the pod it feels like all of the boring parts of a like mid 90s thriller yes like one of it's those like the part like, of independence day before the alien actually blasts the white house Yes, yeah. This is like one of those, um, like the like like se- like pseudo sexual thrillers that were all the rage in the mid nineties. Oh yeah, because Hugh Grant does have a Michael Douglas esque scene where he tries to have sex with his wife in the shower. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's very, it's very like it feels very like I'm gonna, we're gonna rip off Basic Instinct, which is fine. Well, it's fine for the mid '90s. I don't know I about mean, 2020. <laughs> I mean, it's fine to do a '90s thriller in the 2020s. I guess true, like that Renee That's Zellweger it. show we watched. Yes. Yeah. That one um, that we also hated. The, well, yeah, at least say what you will about that one, but at least it was going for it. <laughs> oh, this, this one's not going for it? What I don't is know, it? What's a, what's a, yeah, that's the thing. What is it that it's going for? It's just, it, it seems to be telling a story that is, like, pretty run-of-the-mill. Uh, yeah, it feels like, yeah, I don't know where they're going to go with this. I mean, she finds out her husband killed someone. Picking up the pieces from that would just take like years and years. Yeah, Seems um, like it should, maybe this should have just been a movie instead I'm, of an HBO show. I'm guessing, and this is just a, this is a hypothetical here, but I'm guessing that what's going to happen is that like there's going to be like a reveal that Grace, like Grace, has been withholding information from the viewer or something. Grace is Nicole Kidman's character. Oh, yeah, I think there has been some implications of that. Yeah, because uh, she has the scene in the gym bathroom, and then we cut later to a, more of that scene that it wasn't yes. originally displayed. So I think <laughs> that gym bathroom scene. <laughs> yes, uh, as you know, both... classic gym bathroom scene. You know, just walking up to someone fully nude and standing in front of them, your mm-hmm. genitals at the height of their face, <laughs> talking about how things went the last time you met. Yeah. Um, so, of course, the person doing this is uh, the enigmatic woman named Elena, who yes. uh, j- joins the school that um, the the uh, great uh, Nicole Kim and Hugh Grant's son attends. And she has um, spectacular breasts, according which, to one of the characters on this program. Yeah, which uh, the, sh- the show itself makes great note of uh, numerous times. Um, yeah, what do you think about Elena? She's such a character. Real <laughs> developed. She barely speaks English. I think she has, like, maybe ten lines of dialogue total. She vacillates between being oh. nude and crying. Oh, I don't think they were... They like me. Oh, I'm so overwhelmed. Bye-bye. Uh, oh, also, I guess when she's not e- doing either of those things, she is, uh, making... Kiss. Uh, yeah, kissing a woman. Nice. Yeah. Uh, th- that's. I think that also feels very mid nineties. <laughs> yeah, we got to rip off Mulholland Drive, Swanson. <laughs> yeah, true. Where's the like? Where's the burn victim? So we're sort of jumping all over the place, but there's like, there's not a lot to it, to be honest. We see them go through their basic life. Like their day to day life. Uh, Hugh Grant is all bummed out because he has to go attend this fundraiser for his son's school and he doesn't want to wear a tuxedo. Um, Mood. Which, yeah. Also, fuck you, you bougie scum. Yes. <laughs> uh, so he's there and he's like miserable the entire time. Um, yeah, did and... you see a single black family at the fundraiser? No, did and I... I was trying to figure out if that was purposeful or not. <laughs> Cause I they, mean, it, it would be accurate. It's true, because they have a whole thing where the lady gets up on stage and talks about the diversity of their school. <laughs> where the only person of color that we see at all in the show is uh, Elena, who is dead uh, cool. at the end of the episode. But she's also gay, so that's like double diversity. Ooh, true. Well, she's not... She does have a husband. Uh, only have gay people have husbands. Swanson. Yeah, well, we usually just call them <laughs> bisexual or pansexual or <laughs> whatever. Um, so yes, Elena also is constantly talking about Grace's kindness every time they meet, oh. which seems like another thing that might be a clue that there's something else going on here. I'm not sure. Maybe uh, Grace is going to be like a Christ allegory. Yeah. I think the problem with assuming that there's going to be some twist to the narrative here is that we don't get anything in this first episode that suggests that something uh, other than what is being transpired is transpiring. Like, yeah. like everything that happens, we're 
led to believe is exactly what was supposed to happen. Like, there's nothing in the Until- direction or the writing that gives us a sense that, like, things are off. Well, except for the fact that Elena Desac's completely bizarre. That's kind of off. Well, yeah. You, start, you didn't like, mention she is off. additional yeah. information in the flashback. But yeah, this is all very... Yeah. Their sense of reality on the show is very uh, concrete. Yeah. Um, and also, the standout uh, moment of the show, of course, is the two seconds that Donald Sutherland is on screen oh. as Nicole Kidman's dad. Yeah. Uh, he shows up just to be like, I hate fundraisers too. And he's like, yeah. all right, bye. I'll probably be relevant later in the go, plot. I gotta go be in the auction for Uncut Gems. <laughs> yeah, he's really making a play for auctioneer, for being in auctions. <laughs> He's an octogenarian auctioner. Was it Donald right. Sutherland's dad who was the guy who got Canada national health care? Or was it Donald Sutherland's granddad? Probably one of them. Oh, well. Yeah. Good. It's a good story, though. Good on them. Maybe, maybe Keith or Sutherland can do that for us. <laughs> yes. Jack Bauer style. Yeah. <laughs> You're gonna you're gonna pass Medicare. Where for are all. the copays? <laughs> you're gonna pass Medicare for all. You're gonna do it, and you're gonna like it. Um. Yeah. Oh, Donald Sutherland himself was a member of the Canadian New Democratic Party. Wow. Apparently. Uh, apparently, from what I can gather here, his second marriage was to Shirley Douglas, the daughter of Canadian Social Democrat and father of Canadian's universal health care system, Tommy Douglas. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, uh, that's Kiefer's so, mom. So that's Kiefer's valor. That's, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it really is Kiefer's fight, you know? Oh. Oh. Shirley Douglas helped establish the fundraising group Friends of the Black Panthers. In 1969, oh. she was arrested in Los Angeles for conspiracy to possess unregistered explosives after she allegedly attempted to purchase hand grenades for the Black Panthers. Yeah, the, uh, these people <laughs> kick ass. Yeah. Shirley Douglas, come on the pot. Oh, she died in April 5th. Yeah. That's a shame. <laughs> From pneumonia. So, possible COVID death. Who knows? COVID took another great one. Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty awesome. Better than anything yeah. that happens in this show. No one's yeah. getting arrested for trying to help the Black Panthers. Yeah, no one's getting exploded. What was that show? Gamora? That Italian crime Pandora? drama? Pandora? No, no, the Italian crime drama. That was... Fu- it was something like Gamora. Like, they did this fake out where one of the characters is talking to this man at a cafe, and he's like, I need your help. The uh, The guy down the street does not respect me. And then these other mafia guys come in and just unload on the cafe with machine guns and throw hand grenades in there. Oh, it's like, oh I guess we're not doing that subplot. <laughs> I guess that's one yeah, way to... That's one way to write a subplot and that you don't like and then get rid of it immediately. <laughs> I wish I could remember what that show was called. Like, oh, that, that, that would be one way for J.J. Abrams to have just done Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> Italians just murder... Uh, what's uh, her? Rose ooh. Tico? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a. Uh, it's kind of fucked that he just sort of left left her off the. <laughs> yeah. Uh, man, that movie sucks ass. Uh, so or yes. less fucked than not having Finn do anything at all. It's having uh, John Boyega like, take up space. I would say equally as fucked. Although Finn doing nothing at all and hanging out with a bunch of other black people <laughs> was pretty fucked. <laughs> it's like the kids' table at a wedding. <laughs> yeah, like he, he, they have him set up. The weirdest part about that, oh god, we're gonna go on another Star Wars la- tirade, but oh, the weirdest part is, yeah, that th- that he those has ladies, this... yes, yeah. they have nothing to do with his personal quest as an escaped sub stormtrooper. No, and also no. like they set it up like he has like a romantic interest so that Ray can go off and do whatever with Kylo, 
But then she yeah. doesn't even hang out with him at the end. She gets with Billy D. Williams. <laughs> Whoa. Because there's no because the editing and the oh, like yeah. cut makes it doesn't make it clear that that is Lando's daughter that he's talking yeah. to and not him <laughs> just hitting on a woman th- three times his age. Yeah, literally the exchange is. So you never you've never known your father. How about we find it out together? Yeah, like it sounds like <laughs> him being epic. like, "You never met your dad." Well, I could be one. How would I bend you over the twenty three and Me website server? <laughs> So yeah, it's it's very strange. Um, that movie sucks. It's like a masterpiece in bad script writing. <laughs> like Tommy Wiseau should take notes. Tommy Wiseau could make a better Star Wars movie than J.J. Abrams. Yes. Um, that would be more pathos, for yeah. sure. It's weird too because um, I don't remember the dude who was originally going to run that the that episode nine. Garthinus. That's. <laughs> Could you imagine? It was, it was like some guy. He was the guy who did Jurassic World, I think. So there's no. Yes, it might have been. It might have been worse, but I don't know if it could. Call, call him something. Colin Trevorrow, maybe. Yeah, it's Colin Trevorrow. It was Colin Trevorrow. Yeah. Um, yeah, his script at least kind of had some out there stuff. Yeah, it also didn't have the. It didn't also confirm like that Palpatine gets it wet. Like Hux has a Mace Windu's lightsaber and kills himself with it when the yeah. first order is about to fall. I would rather that uh, a Star Wars sequel do some out there stuff than just do oh nothing that actually happened in the original trilogy matters. Yeah, like just have a guy get thrown out of a spaceship while they're in hyperdrive and have him end up in a different dimension. Yeah, do something ridiculous. Don't do Chewbacca might be dead. No, he's not. <laughs> For ten minutes. Yes. <laughs> oh, God. Or he's captured off screen by some bad guys who want to establish his tough. If Why we... not show them beating up Chewbacca? Yeah, exactly. If we keep talking about this for too long, someone is going to donate to our buy me a coffee and make us oh, watch yeah. Rise I of will Skywalker. Kill myself if you do that, <laughs> do not do that. That's the one thing we must never do. Literally any other Star Wars film, just not Rise of Skywalker. You must never watch this movie. Even the holiday special. I would gladly box. watch the holiday special. I've yeah. never seen it, so. Let's watch the droids cartoon next week. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, so, on. as for what happens in the rest of this, um, uh, basically, they have this fundraiser. Elena encounters Grace once again after. Uh, so, Elena is this lady who comes into um, the committee that Grace helps run that's like running this auction for the school. Yes. Um, yeah, and privately, yeah. mm-hmm. it's revealed that she's like a sing, like a not a single mother, but she has like a newborn and this other child. And because they're of, estranged, yeah, because of her because of her social status, it's not clear how she's actually able to afford going to the school. Um, but I guess because she doesn't want to seem racist, Grace never brings this up. Um, although but she does have a friend who's very Karenish. Yes, uh, who uh, I don't also, know. We will never remember her name. No, there's also a so weird she, bit where Elena is like breastfeeding, and all of the mothers are like, <gasps> "Oh yeah, they just stop and they're slow mo reaction shots." Yes, because they don't they've forgotten what breasts are. And um, there's like this shot of her feeding the child, breastfeeding the child. It's almost like a painting, like some Michael Mann shit. Yes, <laughs> yeah. The direction is actually really good. Yeah, that's a strange thing. Uh, like they it, spent all their money on photography instead of screenwriting. Yeah, like um, I, I like I, I'm very. The direction is like maybe one of the redeeming parts of this. Um, so then Elena shows up later at a gym and confronts Grace by but, nude. Well, confront no is tell. confront is different than what actually happens because what it is is just them having a very sexually charged encounter. <laughs> Um, and that can, that all comes to a head at the auction where they're on and they're in an elevator together and Elena kisses Grace before breaking down in tears. Um, and she leaves and then she's dead the next day. Um, and that's where the, the whole undoing begins. Yes. Um, cause what we learn near the end here is that, uh, 
Well, yeah, obviously the police have ruled this a murder. They do a lot of questioning of Grace. Grace makes a rookie mistake here and lets the police into her home. Yeah, never let, the, never talk to the police without a lawyer <laughs> present. Yes. Or a gun. <laughs> well, both, ideally. Mm-hmm. Um. So, yeah, like, rookie mistake, of course, like, clearly someone who's never had to deal with the police or watched Breaking Bad. <laughs> um. So, uh... I actually don't know if Breaking Bad is the one who taught me that. I think it's The Wire that taught me that. Yes. The Wire has a lot of scenes showing you how the police can just get fuck you over with the most innocuous of rhetorical tricks. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, uh, Elena's husband is also noted as a potential suspect, but never it's never explained why, although he is doing some shady stuff, as we learned at the end, because he left his phone at their apartment. And apparently he's not in any of the hotels in the city he said he was going to a conference at. Yes. So, uh, Gra- Grace seems to have some, like, very uh, paranoid reminiscences of things going on. Mm-hmm. Um, which, that's well, that's what's leading me to believe that maybe there's going to be some twist involved here, but uh, uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. They do briefly show Elena's body, and she did get pretty grisly murdered. Oh, yeah, her face is just like spaghetti now. Yeah. It's like hamburger. It's no, it's, it's no good. Um, yeah. And that's pretty much the episode. Uh, and, yeah, I don't know. There's not a whole lot here. Um, it's very... I think they're going for atmospheric, but I'm not really feeling that atmosphere. Uh, yeah. I think the show needed more Hugh. This episode needed more Hugh Grant because if the premise of the show is really about Hugh Grant not being the man that Nicole Kidman thought he was, then we should get more scenes of him. I think. Yeah, or like at the very least, since he's going to be on the run for the next episode or two, presumably. Yeah, you like at the very the screenplay. At the very least, you need to establish their relationship as more than just like traditional. I guess New York socialite relationship. <laughs> oh, it's they're New York socialites. They have no souls. Yeah, that's true. Well, uh, they, Hugh Grant does, and that's why he wants to kill himself. Yeah, yeah. Hugh Grant also seems to hate socializing, which is relata- <laughs> intensely relatable. He seems very fucked up. Like he's yeah. got a job talking to children with cancer, and you know, treating them. Oh yeah, there was a real but weird also- scene that felt very on the nose, where he's um treating a child and like being like very kind and i was like i get it he's supposed to be a murderer well maybe he's kind and a murderer maybe this is about the duality of man swanson yeah the, the, maybe that's, maybe not- that's the thing they're stacking the deck so much that he is the murderer that like if it if it is the case then it's just the most boring tv show ever <laughs> maybe the pl- maybe the plot twist is that elena deserved to be murdered oh <laughs> yeah the undo- yeah. she was the one undone yeah, the detective's like, well, guess she had it coming. <laughs> oh, you're off scot-free, white man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm then gonna gets hit this... by a Molotov from a protester. And... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give this a tune-out. Yeah, tune-out. It's very unrealistic how the streets aren't just filled with constant civil unrest. Yeah. And also nobody's wearing masks. How can I relate to this? It's really weird to see a show set in New York... <laughs> Where everyone is just going about their daily lives. <laughs> and they can afford housing. That's yeah. also very strange. That strange. also strange my belief. Yeah, this is a bad first episode. There's a lot of there's the ingredients for a good show here, but I just I didn't click with me. No, and like like the the cast is pretty stacked. No, this is like the best yeah. This is like an all star team. <laughs> Uh, it's just like there's just nothing here. It's pretty run of the mill, even like even with the stuff it's got. Um, like, is next what what is episode two gonna be? Is it about Hugh Grant on the run? Is it gonna be the fugitive? Did he uh, even, even show up? Do we do we want to spoil it? I don't. I didn't. Know. I didn't watch episode two, but I did read a synopsis of it. Oh, what's the synopsis say? Uh, so um, we can just bleep it out if it's too egregious. Uh, just skip ahead, like, five minutes, let's say. Well, if that's, that might be the end of the pod. Just skip ahead two minutes. Um, I'll just say how long it's been. So, yeah, his, uh, apparently he was terminated from his job 
oh. because of alleged uh, inappropriate contact with Elena. Oh, um, and that that's what makes him his prime suspect. Um, but also he uh, admits to uh, Grace at the end of the episode when he turns up at their beach house, uh, which ugh, um, oh. that he is that he uh, he did have he did have an affair with her, but never. Uh. But he insists he never murdered her. And then Grace calls the police. Uh, how many episodes is it supposed to be? I think uh, right now the Wikipedia list is six. Uh, I feel like they're not going fast enough for my taste. That's a tune out. Yeah, if you're going to do a twist, you have to start showing that some things are wrong in that second episode. And it doesn't seem to be the case with this synopsis. Mm-hmm. Um, also, it might just be election stuff, but the third episode, which came out November 8th, did like one third the ratings of the first two episodes. <laughs> Ooh. November. What, all the. Bi- Wait. November 8th, that's like a week after. Why would it drop? Uh, I don't know. Do you I guess think the audience are too busy filing lawsuits? Well, Sunday was what was right after they called it, wasn't it? Oh, so you think all of their, the audience killed themselves? That's or went to brunch. That's one right. Two. They went to brunch. Yeah. <laughs> then wear any. They took their masks off and they went to brunch and died. Yes. One could hope. Uh. So yeah, that's uh, that's a tune out on the undoing. Uh, looks like it's been undone. Yeah. Do better next time, HBO. Yeah. Undo this show. Um. That's it for this week's episode of the Pod. Uh, hey, listen, if you like what you're hearing, uh, we have a Buy Me a Coffee page. And if you go over there and donate, you can request a bonus episode for the pod uh, on any topic yes. that you want. Uh, we have a we have a bunch of people who have been doing that, and uh, we're, we're going to be getting to those shortly. Uh, the backlog is currently eight films. <laughs> at least. Uh, and, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll be rolling out, of course, classic TV content every Tuesday. So you can look forward to that uh, next. Until next week, keep watching. Bye. It's over. Perhaps you too can help solve an unsolved mystery.